Hello, I'm Thomas Wolf um, from Hugging Face, Chief Scientific Officer. So today the topic of the meetup is about NLP and in particular transfer learning in NLP, which is what we've been doing a lot at Hugging Face. Um, <clears throat> I will talk about first that we present you uh, what is transfer learning, if you don't know, you will learn quickly about that. Then I will uh, discuss what we are doing at Hugging Face, uh, show you a little bit about our tools. Um, and then the last part is about the current trends in NLP um, and then a few takeaways. Okay, pretty regular. So some of these slides are adapted from a tutorial I gave at NACL uh, last summer with some of my collaborators, uh, the amazing uh, Sebastian, Matthew and Sweba. So uh, thanks a lot to them. And in particular, if you want more information, please click on the link here. We have, I think, around 300 slides on, on this topic, so you will know everything. And one of the very nice things about this tutorial that we gave at NACL is that there were a lot of hands-on exercises. There are like Google Collabs, there is a GitHub repository, so you can run all the exercises. So really, if, if you want, just feel free to check it and try this out. Okay, uh, what is transfer learning? Good question. Uh, so the usual way we, we train a uh, machine learning model is that we, we have a first task. Uh, okay, let's see if I can have a pointer. Yeah. So let's say we are, we are, we are faced with, with task one, okay? So we've gathered this nice data set <clears throat> on our task. We randomly initialize our model and then we train it and we have the model we use in production now. Um, if we have a second task, usually we gather a new data set. We train the model from scratch again on this new data set and we use that in production. And we do that again if we have a third task, okay? So that's kind of strange because uh, humans don't do that, right? We don't forget everything we do each time we face a new task. Usually we don't randomly initialize our brain back uh, when we like join a new, a new job. Uh, we use all the thing we've gathered, all the knowledge we've learned in previous tasks at that we've learned at school, that we've learned with our parents, that we've learned basically with all the life experience. We have all this knowledge. We use that when we are faced with a new task that we call the target task. And this thing allows us to get two main benefits. The first one is that usually we can learn very fast. Uh, we can learn with just a few examples. A lot of humans, you give them two examples, they're good with a lot of tasks, even very complex tasks. And the second good uh, advantage is that um, usually we reach super high performance because we use all that knowledge so we kind of connect the dots, you know, between the examples that we're given. We're like, oh yeah, I see what you mean. And yeah, that's why we get to like really high performances. So transfer learning is one idea, is one way to, to try to do that for machine learning models, okay? Uh, then another good uh, reason is that basically um, <clears throat> in NLP, there are a lot of things that are in common between the tasks, okay? We know that if we've learned some stuff about English, well, probably if we have a new task which is about English, we can reuse a lot of task knowledge, okay? We, we can reuse the knowledge of synonyms that we know. We can also reuse um, structural semantics or even semantics. If you know like question answering, if you've learned uh, question answering in English, now, if you're faced with question answering the, the same task in French or like in any other language, German, probably you can reuse the underlying semantics that you've learned, okay? Even though the surface syntax or the, like the surface forms are different, like the underlying ideas are the same, okay? Then another good reason to use transfer learning is that annotated data is rare. So if you can combine the data set that you use for several uh, tasks, if you can combine them, you get more data and that's usually a lot better for all this uh, machine learning models. Okay, um, and then the last thing about much, uh, transfer learning is that we can use unlabeled data. I'll talk about that later. And that's really cool because unlabeled data is very cheap. You don't have to annotate it and it's super abundant because we have this thing called the internet where a lot of people are just posting huge loads of text everywhere. So if we can reuse all this unlabeled text, that's really great. And now the last reason and maybe the more convincing one is that empirically, uh, transfer learning has resulted in the state of the art for many NLP tasks. So let, let, let me take one uh, cherry picked example, which is this task called named entity recognition. That's a fairly old task. Well, this, this for example, this data set is now, now 15 years old, more than 15 years old. And um, 
you can see there is a, the, there have been a series of jumps, right, in the um, in matrix we measure, which is the F1 in this case. And basically, all these jumps there are uh, they came from some form of transfer learning. Okay, these first jumps in the uh, in the year 2009 were about using what is what is um, a variant of brown clustering. Okay, is this original way to use and label data. And then here you see the beginning of the neural nets. This is the uh, Weston and Kolberg paper. That was the time of um, the test of time award uh, not long ago. And then you see all this uh, neural network getting better. And here all these last jumps are basically combination of transfer learning with neural networks. So here you see Tagalm, which is just a predecessor of Elmo. And here you see uh, all the gems with birds and the variant of the of transferring we see now. So let's uh, dive a little bit into how this looks in practice. Um, what we use a lot today is called sequential transfer learning. It's called sequential because there is a sequence of steps. So usually there are at least two steps. Uh, the first step is called pre-training. This step is very computationally intensive. Why is it? Because in, during these steps, we try to leverage all the data set we can. And in particular, we try to leverage a big corpus of unlabeled data. So we try to leverage the web basically here, right? These steps end up with a general purpose reusable representation. This can be what you probably know, which are called the word vectors. These are now very old, like, like a, fairly old in, in the deep learning world. So they are like uh, eight to eight to eight year old basically. And uh, more recently, what we share as a general purpose reusable representation is more a, a fully trained model, for instance, BERT model or GPT or ULMP. Okay. So this model has been trained on usually uh, a training objective, which is not the one we are interested in, but which is one training objective that we know lead to good general purpose representation. So why, why do we say general purpose? Because then we have the second step, which is called the adaptation, on which we can choose between all the target tasks we're interested in, okay? So for instance, we might be interested in text classification, uh, labeling if like a tweet is positive or negative. We can be interested in sequence labeling, it can be like name entity recognition is, is one example of sequence labeling, where we label some tokens to be named entity, like for example, name of companies we're interested in. We want to label this one to know if they are in the, in a, in a given sequence of, of words, or can be Q&A, question answering. So we are all these diverse, well, we have all these variety of NLP tasks, and we can all, like, um, <clears throat> we can, starting from the same model, we can uh, fine tune it on all these different tasks separately. So this is called the adaptation, or also called the fine tuning step, usually. So this is quite different. In this step, we have a small data set, usually. And um, we want this to be very data efficient, okay? Because here we have to annotate. We have to like list if uh, the tweets are positive or negative. We have to label the answer to the question. So here, this part is expensive to produce the data set. So we want it to be um, very efficient, like very data efficient. And we usually reach very high performance these days. So for pre-training, there has been the rise of uh, language modeling. So I was talking, I was talking a lot about uh, unlabeled data sets. So the way we leverage this is by using what we call language modeling. So language modeling is about pre predicting the probability of a text. So what does it mean? Well, you can usually split the text in like sequence of words, for, ex for instance, and you can just uh, having one model that is able to predict the, the probability of a word given the context, you can just uh, actually decompose this as the product of the probability of the words given the context that they have. And this is just basically this, uh, the objective we're optimizing. So why do we optimize this objective, the probability of text? Well, many, many nice things about it. The first one and the main, the main interest is that it doesn't require human annotation, right? You're just predicting the text. So you just need some text. Basically, the text that you give, like the training that set, should have probability of one or should have the highest probability. And the rest is usually the, the lower probability way. You only have label for the text that you give anyway. Um, we can have uh, enough texts on the web for many languages, and like actually a lot more languages than people can think about it. I mean, we can have like 100 languages uh, wh where there is definitely enough text to learn a high quality model. And it's very versatile. So I was talking about uh, decomposing this in the product of probability over words, but it could also be decomposing the product of probability over sequence 
or like a product of probability over like short span of words. So it's actually very versatile and there are various ways you can uh, f formulate these uh, training objectives. And they're all quite interesting and people are still like exploring a lot what you can do. So here I give some example, uh, but yeah, there are definitely a lot of ways you can approximate this or decompose this and um, they, we are still learning the best way we, we should do. Um, here are just a few notes, more practical to give you a feeling. So it, this pre-training, as I said, it was, it's quite intensive. So there are a lot of uh, like crazy reports about the cost to train bird, the cost to train all these like state-of-the-art models. Um, for last year's tutorial, I tried like to reach out smaller costs and see how is like a standard way. And basically you, you kind of need like roughly one day on the hate GPU to reach some good perplexity and some like good transfer learning models. So if you look at the tutorial we gave last year, we reached state of the art on uh, text classification. So the models were pretty good and I trained them for like one day on AG, AG, AG GPU. So um, one consequence of this is that it's very important to share the, the models that you free train so that people just don't all spend one day to train all their model and basically don't spend this time to retrain something that has already been trained by somebody else but who didn't care about open sourcing. So that's a lot of things. That's, I mean, a lot of, um, that's something very important we try to push for at Hugging Face. Um, it's fairly, oh sorry, it's fairly robust to the choice of hyperparameter. Usually you can't really overfit uh, language modeling because the task is just too difficult to solve. Like solving the, the, the task of predicting, for instance, the next word given the pre previous one, which is one typical way to decompose the, the probability of a text, is just not really possible. Like there is no, um, if I give you the beginning of sentence, there are always several possible completions. So the task, the task is really hard and you can't really overfit on it. So um, it's very easy to prepare your model. Basically, um, a lot of, uh, a, a wide range of hyperparameter will give good results. Uh, there are interesting results from like iClear of this year, for instance. Uh, given that it's hard to overfit, you usually don't need to really regularize your model. Um, yeah, these are interesting, like practical thing, larger to pass is better. Um, there is something interesting, the last part, Electra is a model that was actually open source um, this week by Google. Um, it's a model that was, that was done by Kevin Clark, um, which is very interesting because it's a lot um, less, it's a lot more compute efficient. So we are currently like just right now integrate, integrating it in Huggy Face and it's a, it's a nice model. Um, okay, this is a mass language model, uh, I don't really want to talk about that right now. There are a few current trends. Um, so as I was saying, people are just playing with the objective, trying to see what is the best way to formulate this prediction of text. You can, you can add it like sentence ordering loss, which is for instance, trying to help the model by also forcing it to learn if one sentence is the predecessor of the next sentence or one sentence follow uh, another sentence. This is some other way to try unlabel text prediction. There is this uh, discriminative uh, language modeling from Electra. Spanbert language modeling is about um, trying to predict span, which means several words. Regularization, there are very, very interesting. So these are just pointer if you want to read more, but like people are really still like trying to play a lot with this thing. Dropping, layer drop is interesting. I talk a little bit less um, at the end. The idea is that you can, um, try to make the model learn to um, work without some layers. And why is that interesting? Because at the end you can remove some layer, which make it a smaller model, which is interesting. Okay. A lot of people have been playing with the architecture as well. Um, with the word of uh, Saint Barsuk Bata from uh, Facebook is very interesting on this. The work of Guillaume Lamp as well. So these are all open vari variants of the architecture. Right now, I mean, the, the takeaway from that is that uh, mostly the, the quantity of data you use for pre-training is the key. So you can have very simple architecture and if you train them with more data, you can actually usually um, get better performance than complex architecture like XML. So just scaling up right now is the best way to improve these models, but it's still open as to whether there might be some variants that would work better. Now, once you've pre-trained these models, you want to adapt it on your target task. So um, how do you do that? That's really simple and that's really interesting. Um, the general workflow goes like this. 
you will remove the pre-training task head. So usually your pre-training task head is the last, so it's the last layer of your model. Usually just uh, for the pre-training, it just means projecting back your model hidden, hidden layer on the vocabulary. So you want to predict some words, so you have this vocabulary, and usually it's during the pre-training, you're just projecting back the hidden state vector on the vocabulary. So you, you remove this, and you just put uh, instead the, the adaptation layer that you want. So if you just want to classify something, you can just add a very simple linear layer on top of, of the model. This linear layer will just project the representation that your model have in the, um, on the number of class that you have. For instance, just project on two class if you're trying to predict like a binary classification task. But it can also be a lot more complex. Um, some people just use BERT as like a frozen generator of embeddings. And then on top of that, you can have like all the classical NLP model that you, that you have usually. And you, you just use the token representation as the inputs, basically the contextual inputs. Sometimes it's even more complex because you may want to actually adapt the model to a task that is structurally different from the one you've been using for pre-training. So you know that when we pre-train, you try to like maximize, maximize the, the probability of some text. So you usually have just one input. This input is just the text sequence that you're like, currently uh, inputting in your model. But in a lot of tasks, you have several inputs. One good example is like summarization. If you want to generate the summary, usually you have two inputs. You have like the, the, for instance, the news articles you're trying to summarize. And the other input is the beginning of the summary. You're already like, uh, your model has started to generate and you want to generate, for instance, the next token. So you have the beginning of the summary and you have the, the, the news article. So how do you adapt your model, which is used to have just one input in a model, which can have two inputs? So here there are like several ways. I, I will show you a little bit later, but basically, you will usually like duplicate your model or you can just basically actually uh, completely uh, destroy your model and rebuild a new model from it. So there are many, many ways and still many interesting ways. We, we are like many interesting uh, experiments to try. Um, so uh, I will just show you two very practical examples so you see how it looks like. So let's say we want to do class text classification. Okay, so we have this model which is trying to predict some text. And we want to use it to actually classify some sequences. So um, we will take the input. So here we have our text input. Usually we add a beginning and an end token. Why do we do that? Because this model, they generate one hidden states for each token, okay? So we need to, if we want to do classification, we need to actually pull all these uh, hidden states together to like get a single vector, which basically, if you want, represent the meaning of the sentence. And from these single vectors, we can project it using the linear layer, the very simple linear layer I was talking about, okay? So one way to do that is to add a special token at the end that, will, uh, that the model will learn as um, the meaning token of the sequence. So the, the model will learn to put some representation of the, of the meaning, at least the meaning that's relevant for our classification task. So the model will then put the, the representation of the meaning in this last token hidden state, okay? So we just take this last uh, vector, we put it in the, the linear layer, and then we project this. So this is one example. That's what we did actually in the tutorial last year. So if you look at the slide that I were referring to in the beginning, you will see that there are like a lot, of, lot more details on this, but here just to show you a brief overview, um, this task is called TREK6. It's a six class classification, hence, hence the number six. And the idea is to um, classify some intents in the dialogue, okay? You have somebody asking for something, for instance, and you will classify if the question is related to like a description or if the question is related to, for instance, like a, a date or something like that, okay? And um, as I told you, with this very simple model we had that I trained like one day, um, you can then fine tune it and you see two main things. The first thing is that after just one valid, one epoch of fine tuning, you already get an error rate, which is less than 10%. So we already get like over 90% accuracy, just going one epoch over our, our fine tuning uh, data set. And it's, it's a small data set for Trexis. It's just like, I think it's 2,500 examples, something like that. So it's very small. And uh, we already get like a very good accuracy. So the models are very data efficient. That's a good thing. And the second thing is that if we train for like three epochs, 
we reached an error rate of 3.6, which was actually the state of the art around that time. That was the ULMP paper from Jeremy Howard and Sebastian Ruder. And we basically reached their number with just our tutorial code. So that's, this, this is really an approach that's, that brings you easily to the state of the art. It's also often uh, quite robust to the choice of the fine-tuning hyperparameter. In this case, I just used like this hyperparameter from the literature, very uh, standard one, and they basically work very well. Now let's look at another example that will be very different. So you see just how actually widely applicable this approach is. Here is a dialogue generation task. In this dialogue generation task, as I told you, we have many types of inputs, okay? So this one is called the, the persona chat data set. That was uh, one that were held during the um, new risk competition we, we participated in uh, two years ago. And you have like uh, three types of inputs, basically. The first one is a knowledge base. So your, your chatbot has a little persona. So this one is an artist with four children uh, who got a cat, likes walking for exercise and really love watching Game of Thrones. There is another type of input, which is the, the dialogue history, okay? There were already two, two utterances, the, like the user saying hi, and then the bot saying, hello, how are you today? And now we get the new utterance, the last one from the user. The user is saying, I'm good, thank you, how are you? And what we want from all these type of inputs, we want to generate a response. That could be something like this. Great, thanks, my children and I were just about to watch Game of Thrones. So you see, like, reusing the knowledge base. So there are this, all these type of inputs. So these are the three here, but also the beginning of the reply, because usually the genera these generation models, they generate word by word. So you need to input what the model has already generated to, to reach the next word. So how do we convert our model that was trained from uh, to handle a single input in a model that can work in this dialogue setting? So there are many ways we can do that. Uh, mostly two. Uh, actually, we have an ACL pa short paper last year on that. Um, you, you can concatenate all these. For instance, you can just uh, concatenate all the persona, the history, and the beginning of the reply, and just build a single input for your model like that. Then you put that in the model, and the model will generate the next token. At the end. Okay, so that's the simplest way, and it actually works surprisingly well. This is called sometimes a prefix LM. Um, but that's a, that's a good way to do that. Another way, it's quite natural. If you know encoder, decoder, that's the, that's the standard way to do conditional generation. So in, in the second way to do that, oh, in the second way, you will actually duplicate your model. So you have an encoder, a decoder. They are both initialized from the same pre-trained model. They are connected with uh, cross-attention. And one of these uh, models will be handle some type of input, and the other model will, will handle the other, other type of inputs. Okay, so that's another way. We compare this in this ACL model. They have trade-off, basically, uh, that you can read in this. Okay, so now you know a little bit about transfer learning, so I will talk a little bit about Hugging Face, what we do, why we do it, and uh, show you a little bit about how, uh, our tools. Okay, so the goal of Hugging Face is to democratize NLP. Um, we have a core research interest, which is slightly different from other people, I would say. For a lot of people, they like AI as the way to make sense of data. They like to like have models process data to extract insights. What at Hugging Face we were really interested in uh, at, the at the beginning and still now was something slightly different, which is artificial intelligence as a source of creativity, as a source of generative um, interaction. Like for instance, you can think about the GANs, all these generative models that have started to explode in recent years, and they're like all this way to create new stuff instead of just trying to understand the things that are right there. We think that that was like super interesting, and that's why we started as a conversational AI company, because if you look at NLP, like the most interactive, creative uh, uh, task in NLP is dialogue, right? That's just the core of interaction. That's just the core of generating something new from the interaction between a human and, and uh, artificial intelligence. So we had this, uh, this game that was actually quite, quite successful that was targeted on teenagers and, and millennials. We had like 3 million users. We were training our own bird model, basically, on the model, on the messages. We get, we get more than 600 million messages. And while we were building this, this game and this, this, uh, this conversational AI, we actually developed all these open source tools 
um, uh, about transfer learning. And they got so much traction that we decided basically this was the best way to achieve our objective of democratize NLP was mostly to actually catalyze and democratize research NLP as it uh, as a general field and that we could actually do this. So um, now we are mostly doing that. So we're mostly uh, trying to catalyze the field as a whole. And we do that by uh, a lot of things uh, around sharing. So we do a lot of knowledge sharing. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm happy to talk with you. That's why I'm happy to show you what we've done. Uh, we organize a lot of conference uh, tutorial at uh, NACL. We organize Sustain LP. We also organize a European summit in Paris in November that you will probably hear, hear about soon, which is called European LP. Um, <clears throat> and we also do what a lot of people know us for which is uh, sharing code and models. So we try to open source what I call the right way, which is kind of tricky balance to find between two extremes. One extreme is the research code from a, a research uh, like undergrad, for instance. Um, this research code is really, it's, it's very nice that they're open source, but they're usually quite tricky to reuse because you basically need to rewrite all the training scripts if you want to adapt them to your, to your thing. And the other extreme are usually production code. These are like, one common line in production code because like the people developing them knows their users so well that they can just draft one common line or they even have like codeless interface okay this is the other extreme so we think this is sometimes not enough flexible in particular for researcher this is not flexible enough so we try to be right in the middle uh, so here i'm slightly toward the left but that's just because the size of my thumb is not the good one but yeah we try to be right in the middle with something that's quite easy to use but that's very flexible and uh, something we really want to do as well is try to break all the barriers we see in the communities. There are barriers between research and practitioner, usually because research code is a bit hard to like reuse. So we try to break these barriers. We also try to break the barriers between frameworks. Like all the companies try to push their own framework. We don't have any framework to push really. So we like PySource, we like TensorFlow, we like JAX, all this framework. We try to make them interoperable. So people can, starting from one, move to the other. Like, use the baselines that was trained in PyTorch, even do there at Google and they use TensorFlow more, right? So we try to break all these barriers that we see and just basically help people do research faster and more efficiently and more reproducibility by sharing code and having good baselines. So we have to, um, oh yeah, well, this is basically what I was saying, yeah. We think sharing model is very important because we use a lot of compute power to train that. I told you about that uh, earlier. Now there are very uh, interesting studies on how much compute power you use. And the, res the response is that they, it's actually a lot. So sharing your train model is a good way to like avoid this um, inefficiency of retraining the same models. We also try to push for a lot of ethical things like um, better reproducibility, like better, um, Envi environmentally friendly NLP. So I was talking about this sustain LP workshop very quickly. That's something uh, really important that we try to push for, which is trying to make this model uh, more efficient. Um, and the last thing we like is to push a little bit more about NLG as well, uh, not, uh, not just about uh, natural language understanding. Now let's dive into our tools. Um, so I show you transfer learning from like a theoretical point of view. Let's look at this from a very practical point of view, okay? Let's say we have this input sentence. This one is like Jim Hansen was a perpetrator. How do we process this thing with our model? The first step is to tokenize it. So tokenization, we, we mentioned we will split this uh, string of characters in like substrings that our model knows. So model, our model has a dictionary. So this dictionary, they are in all these um, transfer learning model, they are open vocabulary. What does it mean? It means that this model are able to process usually any types of inputs or, or almost any types of inputs. So if a, if a word is too complex or unknown, for instance, a puppeter is like a complex and rare word. The model will split it in subwords until it knows all the subwords. Okay, so here we have the suffix er and the prefix, and like the now this word is split so that the, the model knows uh, these subwords in its deck, in its uh, dictionary. Okay, then we convert them in, in numbers, which are just the index in the vocabulary. We run them through our model. Okay, and the model give for each to for each input token the model gives an output, which is a hidden vector, well, a, a vector, which we call the hidden state, okay? 
So here we have one vector for like this first word, which is Jim. We have a second vector for like the, the second word and so on, okay? And all these vectors, they basically represent the, they are the, the inner representation of the model and they take into account the whole context, okay? So this vector is related to Hansen, but this vector is Hansen in the context of this sentence, okay? So now we, then now we have all these vectors. So this is the pre-trained model that we pre-trained, we pre-trained, okay? Pre-training. Then we project them, as I told you, we pull them in one vector and we project that in the, um, on the classification task, for instance. So here, this example is related, is related to classification. So here, for instance, our target uh, task is to predict if the input sentence is true or false. That's a very uh, strange task, but yeah, that's what we try to do. So we just have like a pooling layer. So we can, for instance, just sum or average all these models, or alternatively, we can just take one of them, for instance, like a special token that we've, we've added at the beginning, classification token. We take this vector, which represents the, the, the whole input sequence, we project it on the, on the target task, on the, on the target uh, vocabulary. So here, just two class. So this part here, it's, um, it's trained during the target task, okay? This part is initialized from scratch on our, on our target task, and this part is uh, pre-trained on this huge corpus. So transform a library is just a way to share this pre-trained model, okay? So you will, um, you will have all these state-of-the-art pre-trained representation, and you will be able to fine-tune them on your target task, or even use the fine-tune model that some people are sharing now. So we made it very easily, very easy to share a model as well, so people can upload their model, and they upload models that are fine-tuned on some tasks. They can also upload models in new languages, so it's very um, interesting as a hub for sharing this, this model. So uh, this is fairly old because it was saying, sorry, it was saying 30 pre-trained models. Now uh, I counted it yesterday. We have 250 models, something like that. So we have a lot of models, a lot more than that. Uh, but they are still in a lot of languages, uh, 100 more languages, okay. Um, yeah, as I told you, a lot of people, it's, it's targeted to break the barriers between researchers and practitioner educators. So a lot of people can use it basically. These are the, some of the models we have. Uh, we have the very uh, famous BERT, GPT, GPT-2. Uh, Roberta is a very good one. It's, it's trained on the, it's, it's the one that was trained on the, the largest amount of data yet, I think, with T5, which is uh, here. <clears throat> and it's, they are designed to be very easy to use. So how do you use that? So from Transformer, you will just import the model you will import the tokenizer. We saw that what this was before, right? Because the thing that was splitting the, the sentences and building the token index. So you import these two with a very simple uh, method called from pre-train. This one will actually download the weights from our uh, extra bucket. We have an uh, open extra bucket for sharing this. And then you can just encode some sequence of, of, of characters or a string. You can just build uh, a tensor for your model using the tokenizer. And you can put this tensor in the model and you get the hidden states that we were talking about. We have a lot of uh, special architecture for this fine tuning task, right? So we were talking about adding this linear layer uh, after the model. So we have pre-made pre architecture for that. They are ready to use. So it's usually very easy to, to use. And the, the, the URL is here, it's on GitHub. You can inspect the code, it's all open source. Now, um, this tokenizer, they are usually like really slow. So this year we started a new task for us trying to make them fast. Uh, why this is important? Because as I was talking, we, we want to train this model on more and more data and we end up sometimes with like terabytes of data. And when you want to process terabytes of data with Python tokenizer, it, it's, really, it's really difficult. They're really very slow. It's hard to do multi-processing, multi-threading because you've got the gill. So what we decided to do is to make the same thing that we were doing for the models, which is to make a very um, efficient library that people could actually use for, um, for tokenizing and that would gather several algorithms. So there are many algorithms for splitting the, the words in subwords. Uh, one of the most famous is called byte per encoding. But there are other uh, GPT-2 use what is called byte level byte per encoding, which is very smart and nice. There is word piece, which is the BERT algorithm to split these tokens. 
Um, so all these algorithms, they are gathered in this library, which is also open source. And it's a very fast library because it's written in Rust and you have uh, bindings in Python and many things. So it's, it's very interesting. Actually, it's now integrated in more and more um, downstream libraries, famous downstream libraries. So be sure to check it out. Why would you want to check it out? Uh, mostly if you are training a new model from scratch, uh, for instance, in your R language, okay? If you want to do a BERT in like Turkish, well, now there is a BERT in Turkish, but if you want to do a BERT in a new language that's, that is not up there, you, you want to have a tokenizer that adapts to your language. So you want to use this library. Uh, so here is where you can install, given the depending on the on the various uh, language program language you like. Um, okay, so here just to show you uh, a little bit about uh, the examples. Let's go very quickly. So I want to show you a few things. So I will go. Um, okay, let's see if I can use this. Oh, I'm really uh, late on my schedule, I'm sorry. So, okay, let's try to go faster. So just to show you maybe uh, very quickly, we, have, we are currently adding a lot of tutorials and notebooks, okay? I wanted to go through them with you, but it's gonna be late. So probably I just show you where they are. We are really on the process of adding more. So, so this is the main repository from the, for the transformer library. There is a notebook session, okay? It used to host fairly old notebooks, but we've totally, um, read on this, so now they are brand new and they're really great. You see, they are like one week old. This is like just what we call brand new. Um, and you have <coughs> collab notebooks so that you can use to show you how to use this tokenizer, how to use this transformer. So here, for instance, is how to, use, how to train a new bird on a, on a new language, Esperanto. So this was done by Julien. You have all the things, you can run it. It's very uh, easy and you have the full process to train a state-of-the-art new BERT model, okay? And you have also an interesting thing about um, uh, getting started with Transformer. It's the same, but uh, just focused on Transformer. So here you have a lot, you see it's very easy to understand. So just code them out. This one show you um, a little bit about what I want to show you now, which is called distillation. So let's go and show. And the last one is about a new feature we get, which is pipeline. So pipeline is basically pulling together one tokenizer on one model to make it very easy to use uh, our work for downstream tasks. So if you are working in production environments, if you're like more interested in just using that rather than training it, you likely want to check pipelines. They are made to be very easy. So this is how look a sentence classification pipeline. <clears throat> From Transformer, you will just import pipeline you will load a sentimental analysis pipeline and you can basically just run it on a sentence and it gives you a label and a score. So here, such a nice weather outside label is positive sentiment and you have the score, which is the confidence from the model, okay? And we have a lot of pipelines for name entity recognition. You can just load pipeline NER and you run it. Hugging Face is a French company based in New York. It extracts all the name entities. So they are split here, for instance, in subwords, but we, we have like, um, things uh, also tools around this to make this easy to use so yeah this is something we are working also on basically because a lot of people were using our tools in production they were actually asking for like ways to make it easier to use okay so let me uh reach the last part of the talk which is uh, a little bit about the current trends in transfer learning so one current trend we see is that the models are getting bigger and bigger. So one model we are working right now with the first author is uh, called T5. It's an 11 billion parameter model. So it's really huge. Actually, it doesn't even fit on one GPU. So these models, they are not production ready at all. You, you can't use them on even one GPU. You need a hate GPU machine just to load the model. So that's a problem, right? Um, it's also a problem because we, we know that um, Actually, growing this model, you need an exponential growth in size of tra or, or training that set just to get a linear uh, gain. Okay, there are many many things that show this, um, which means that there is, we we are kind of plateauing on this. Okay, we are like doubling the size of the model just to get like this ten percent better accuracy or something like that. So uh, at Hanging Face, we are pushing for like smaller model. 
like distilled birds. So this is uh, the work of Victor at our place, a research scientist at Hugging Face. He has been working on a lot of how you can distill this model, how you can make them smaller. And there have been a lot of people who actually uh, worked on that as well. And uh, this work was published a little bit later at the end of last year. They're all quite interesting. And the trend is to make this model a little bit smaller. So I just uh, finished by showing you um, a little bit why we want to, why we can make them smaller. Well, the idea is that um, this large scale model, they learn inductive biases. So because they are exposed to like um, a lot of data, because they're really large, they kind of learn how to generalize well. And we have way to like distill this knowledge in smaller model. So the smaller model will actually be better than a, than a model of the same size, like a small model that was trained from scratch. They will benefit from all the generalization that was learned by the big model. So in, in our example, in the work of distilled bed, we wish like 95% of the, of the bird model on glue, which is like this general natural language understanding task, with a model that's, that's roughly two times smaller, okay? When, which is roughly like two times faster as well. So that's a very good trade-off, right? Uh, um, so the way we do that is that uh, we train the student to mimic the output distribution from the teacher. Okay, so I show you the model. The teacher learn how to generalize. How to generalize. So this is one example from Bert. If we have the the beginning of a sentence, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful. I like to just mask one word, and you ask for Bert to predict the missing token. Like all the all the highest probability tokens that Bert predict, they all make sense, right? It could be a beautiful day. It could also be the beginning of a beautiful life. They all kind of make sense. And this is what uh, we call generalization. Like all the top prediction by the large bird model, they make sense. And what we will try to do during distillation is that we will try to make the small model replicate all these uh, top prediction. So these are kind of like soft labels, if you want, okay? All these top prediction, they are like soft labels for the, for the students. So it has a lot more label in some way. To, to learn, that's why it learns better. Now, uh, the last part is all the problems that we have with transfer learning. So I talk about computational problem, the larger model, and some way we can make them smaller, which is distillation, but there are a lot of more fundamental problems. And one big problem is uh, the fact that we are working on the text itself. Uh, and language modeling. So language modeling is just this tax of predicting the text. And this is obviously not good if we want to use image as input because we only, we only predict text. And this is also quite random because the model is trained to predict any kind, of, any kind of text. And if we use like a general web corpus, there is a lot of junk on it. There is a lot of text that has no real, that, is, that doesn't give a strong signal for semantic, okay? So this is one, one problem. So people try to maybe uh, improve on that by having like pre-trained uh, model. Uh, oh, sorry, this is not actually, these are just all the problem, but yeah. All these things, there are, uh, there are some missing things. And uh, one, uh, one example I like to talk is about is the, is the human reporting bias. What is the human reporting bias? It's that we don't state anything which is really too obvious. So a good example is the, is the black sheep thing. When you ask these models, what color is a, a sheep, like the animal, um, they are really puzzled. And they are puzzled because uh, in text, we talk a lot about black sheep. We're like, this, this was a black sheep, but we don't talk a lot about white sheep because everybody knows that sheep is white, right? It's so obvious that you never say that. And there's a lot of things that are missing in text because they are so obvious that you never write them. You just write the thing that people find interesting. So if you enter in a room with um, no windows, you, you will notice it. You will say, oh, there was no window in this room because that's strange, right? But you will not notice, you will not write every time you enter into a room, you will not write, there were one window because that's not interesting. So this is the reporting bias and that's a strong limit to what we can learn from text. A lot of things are also not written um, because they are not really, uh, they are hard to express as text. So how we can solve that? There are a few ways. We can have like a database. We can have a database that will say sheeps are white. You have a, a connection between sheeps and white. And then the model will, if the model is trained with this database, good, it will learn this kind of common sense thing. You can have multi-model. You can have this picture of a white sheep and the model can just look at the picture and say, oh, okay then I guess sheeps are white. 
or you can have interactive in the loop approach where somebody will correct the model like we correct child we say yeah no sheeps they are white and then the child no but then you need like human in the loop approach so these are all um approach that people are actually experimenting with trying to overcome these problems of text so now there are a few takeaways from this general talk. Uh, please share your model if you train some of them. Um, you should also uh, try to, if you're doing research, you should also share your research code because it's very useful. And uh, I see too many people actually uh, redoing things that have already been done, but just not shared well enough or just not shared at all. And I think this is really 2019 or 2018 now. You shouldn't do that anymore. Um, yeah, this, this is more for researchers, sorry. So I don't know how many researchers are there, but uh, sharing is also a good way to uh, get, give more impact to your work. People will cite it, people will use it. So yeah, this is really what we're trying to, to promote. And I just want to show up on these slides on open sourcing and uh, sharing. I think that's a good way to uh, maybe start the discussion on, on our tools. So yeah, thanks for listening. And I guess we can try to, to switch to the experimental question answering part.